All right, guys, welcome back to the Mercedes Sprinter camper van conversion project. As you can probably tell, we have been hard at work in here. As you can see, we have functional lighting now, which is super exciting. And the biggest thing is this amazing electrical system, which we got finished up. The heart of this system is these two massive batteries from Battleborn Batteries. These are their game changer batteries. They're 270 amp hours each. So if you imagine something like a five amp hour DeWalt battery, this is an even smaller one, but it would be like a hundred of these put together, which is insane. So obviously that'll provide a ton of power here in the van. And this system will power both a 120 volt panel as well as a 12 volt panel. So we'll have plenty of different circuits to run the different appliances and electronics throughout the van. So let's go ahead and rewind so we can see how we got this whole system installed. Before jumping into the electronics, Ty and Teresia did go ahead and get the back windows as well as the flare space flares installed, which got the outside of the van looking super nice. Next, we could start laying out all of the various components for the electrical system, and we decided to build the whole system on a panel on my workbench, which made both assembly and filming a lot simpler. And by we, I mean myself and Nate from Explorist.life, who came out to help on this part of the van project. Nate and his wife, Steph, are experts on van electrical systems, and if you haven't already seen their channel, Explorist.life, I would definitely recommend watching some of their videos to learn way more about this stuff. Anyway, I notched the panel where it met up with the wheel well. And after making sure it fit, we could start getting things roughly situated on the panel, also double checking that the components would clear the huge Battleborn batteries. The first components to get wired were the shunt, which will power the Victron battery monitor, and the master disconnect switch, which will allow the current from the batteries to be shut off. Both of these components are connected to the Lynx distributor, which is a DC bus bar through which all of the DC current will flow, and it also features multiple fuses as kind of redundant fail-safes. Once those were connected, Nate could continue to dial in the layout, and I love to work with insanely detail-oriented people like Nate. It is just so satisfying to watch people like him work. Next up was the 400 amp fuse, which is installed between the disconnect switch and the positive connection on the battery bank. And for this, we needed to make up our first of many cables. In this case, we were using 4 aught cables, and let me tell you, these things were absolutely massive. After stripping back the sheathing, we needed to crimp on some wire lugs to be able to make the connections with these monstrous cables. And the amazing thing about these kinds of crimpers is the force applied when crimping actually cold welds the lug to the wire, meaning the wire and lug are permanently bonded. After crimping, Nate added a length of heat shrink to shield the back half of the lug since it would now be conductive. Finally, he got the wire bolted to the disconnect switch and then could figure out where he needed the wire to terminate where it connected to the fuse block. The fuse in this fuse block is yet another failsafe, providing an automatic disconnect if the batteries have some kind of massive power surge. Next up were a pair of black negative cables, one of which would connect to the battery bank, while the other would be the chassis ground, grounding the whole electrical system to the van. Once those were connected, Nate got these components permanently screwed to the plywood panel to lock everything in place. From there, the inverter got connected to the Lynx distributor with two more massive 4 aught cables, and the inverter's job is to convert the DC current provided by the batteries to AC current. The 120 volt AC panel was then wired to the inverter with another big cable, and a 50 amp breaker was added inside the panel to act as a shutoff. Next, the solar isolator disconnect was installed, which will provide a way to stop the current coming in from the solar panels. The wires from the solar disconnect were run into the solar charge controller, which will regulate the solar charging of the batteries, and the charge controller was then wired back to the Lynx distributor. <laughs> Finally, the Orion DC to DC charger was wired up with one long length of wires, which will run to the van's battery, and the other set connecting back to the Lynx distributor. Also, Nate used a different style of connector here, a crimp-on insulated ferrule, and these not only look super clean, but provide a better connection with these screw terminals found on the Smart Solar and Orion units. And lastly, over on the far side, way over here, is our 12-volt DC fuse panel. That is going to supply power to all of our smaller loads, like 12-volt lights, max air fans. Now this is all finished, we can move it into the van. Before bringing the panel into the van, we decided to go ahead and get the shore power inlet installed on the outside of the van, which meant drilling more holes in the van. 
Thankfully, this was pretty easy to install, first drilling the larger hole for the inlet to fit through, and then another series of holes for mounting the inlet. I used a center punch to mark these holes, which also kept the bit from wandering when drilling, and after drilling, I sealed the holes with enamel paint to keep them from rusting. We also decided to go ahead and knock out some of the branch circuits inside the van while we still had plenty of floor space, and we started with this circuit for the USB chargers and gooseneck lights over the bed. And I should mention that we used 16 gauge wire for these lower current DC circuits and 12 gauge wire for the higher current DC and AC circuits. And this DC wiring couldn't be simpler, we just connected the black to black and red to red, and we were good to go. And we used Wago connectors for all of our connections, and these make for quick, strong wire connections. And I'll link to the specific wire we used in the video description because you shouldn't use any old wire from the home center for this kind of project. It's really best to use marine grade wire, which is rated for higher working temperatures. After wiring the circuit, we could add a little DC barrel plug whip so the circuit could run off of this battery bank. And of course, I had neglected to pay attention to the positive and negative on one of the USB chargers, so it didn't work. Oh, well, I didn't even check. <laughs> is that backwards? Let's see. No, it is wrong. After swapping the connections, it fired right up, and I really like these particular chargers since they have a blue backlight that can be turned on and off with a button on the charger. Next, we could run the circuit for the puck lights, which will be the main light source in the finished van. These were run on two separate branches, so the back half of lights over the bed and front half over the living space could be controlled independently. Each branch was connected to a dimmer switch, and I personally like this more tactile style of switch in this application. Once everything was connected, we could test the lights and they worked great. There was no flickering when the lights were dimmed and these should provide plenty of light inside the van. With that done, we were ready to move all of the electrical components into the van, but first we needed to figure out how we were going to mount the plywood. Thankfully, we had plenty of room on the L-Track we had installed as part of the bed system in the last van video, so I went ahead and drilled and countersunk some mounting holes in the plywood. Once that was done, we got the system moved from my workbench into the van, and unfortunately, I'm still a little limited on my lifting capacity because of my collarbone surgery, so Nate and Ty got that done. Since the shore power inlet was mounted behind where the plywood would be mounted, we went ahead and got it wired up and permanently installed next. I got some L-Track studs installed, and to keep them from falling out while we lifted the panel into place, I went ahead and added a few drops of CA glue just to hold them in place. Finally, we could lift the panel into place and get the bolts added, and a few of these were a little tricky, but we eventually got them installed and the panel felt super secure. Next up was connecting the chassis ground to the van, and we installed a rivet nut in one of the factory holes for this. Once the rivet nut was installed, Nate cut the cable to length, crimped on a lug, and then bolted it to the van using the rivet nut. Next, I ran the wiring for the alternator charging up to the battery, which on this Sprinter van is located under a panel in front of the driver's seat. Nate then wired the overcurrent protection device and the alternator charging was checked off. We got the cables for the solar panels run up to the roof and there happened to be a factory plastic plug in the perfect location for this. I ran the cables through a gland which weather seals the connection and then used some thick sew epoxy to permanently attach the gland to the roof, putting a weight on top of the gland to hold it in place while the epoxy cured. Next, we got the game changer batteries moved into the van and wired up, which included more cable crimping. Nate also used some anti-seize on these stainless steel nuts and bolts, which should make it easier to remove them if needed in the future. Finally, we wired one 120 volt outlet to the 120 volt AC panel and one of the branch circuits we'd installed to the DC panel, and then we could fire up the whole system for the first time. All right, we ready to fire it up? Let's do it. Got light. No smoke, that's a good thing. Okay, let's program it. After turning the system on, Nate went through the process of programming everything, which included updating some firmware, setting battery charge rates, setting battery capacity, and more. Once the inverter was programmed, we could test the 120 volt outlet. Oh God. <laughs> and it worked like a charm, and we could monitor the draw of the light plugged into the outlet in the Victron app. Next, we could test the shore power charging, which worked as expected. Currently, we're charging at about 1,000 watts. So there's 75 amps worth of current, 12 volt going back into it. We also tested the alternator charging, which once again, worked perfectly. Let's 
see that we're charging at a rate of uh, 29 amps. We're charging from alternator. Finally, we got the Serbo GX set up, which is one of the coolest parts of these Victron systems, as it gives you a visual representation of everything happening in your system. In this case, we can see the shore power coming in, along with the AC and DC power being used. Once the system goes through a complete charge cycle, the battery bank percentage will be shown, and once the solar panels are installed later, it will show the incoming solar current. And that was a wrap with Nate, and big thanks again to him for coming out and helping on this part of the project. Again, if you want to take a deeper dive into this kind of van electrical and really all things van building, definitely go check out their channel. They also sell all of the components we used in this system on their online store, which I'll link to in the video description below. From there, I got the rest of the branch circuits roughed in so we could start getting the inside of the van finished out. And after double checking everything, the electrical rough in was officially complete. The first big step in getting the inside of the van finished out was to install the ceiling. But before we did that, we needed to install these super cool trim pieces from Go Code Overland. And if you've ever built out a van, you know how challenging it can be to finish out some of these funky corners, as well as the areas around the door openings. And this transition kit definitely helped to simplify that process, but we still needed to do some custom fitting since we had added a thicker subfloor, furring strips, and other odds and ends. Once the piece was roughly fitting, we got the rib nuts installed, which is how these transition pieces mount to the van. And all these rib nuts are located in factory holes, and they just needed to be enlarged slightly to fit the rib nuts. We installed the topmost piece first since the pillar pieces lap onto this piece, and I did need to trim away a section of the furring strips for this piece to fit, but once that was done, it was as simple as adding the included bolts to the rib nuts. When we went to install the D-pillar transitions, they again interfered with the furring strips, and this time we trimmed the transition pieces instead, since I wanted to make sure I had something to attach the plywood wall surface to later. Once the pieces were installed, we could step back and admire our work, and it's pretty amazing how big of a difference this made in the finished look inside the van. Next, we can install the B-pillar and sliding door transition pieces, and these were a little finicky, I think because we were using the cargo version of the Sprinter van. These pieces attach to the ceiling ribs with a few sheet metal screws, and the ceiling shiplap pieces will overlap the edges of this transition piece. We repeated the process for the driver's side B-pillar, and that was a wrap for the transition pieces. The other big thing Ty had been working on off-camera was getting the diesel heater installed, and he had a diesel mechanic friend help with this installation. And there was some trouble getting everything to function properly, but the heater is working great now. And the thermostat will be mounted in the cabinet above the bed, so they can control the temperature without getting out of bed. The next step in the build was getting the ceiling and walls installed, and I'll cover that whole process in the next video in this series. So make sure to get subscribed and ring the notification bell so you don't miss that video. And I'll have links to all of the tools and materials we used in the video description below. Last, if you want to support me, I sell merch, plans for my woodworking projects, and 3D printed tool storage accessories, and I'll link to those on screen. Thanks for watching, and until next time, happy building. All right, guys, welcome back to the, dang it.